is if you can convert someone that hates spiders into thinking, well, okay, maybe there's something that deserves respect, we might have a bit of hope converting people into sort of bigger environmental concerns, which are obviously uh, you know, a bigger environmental concern right now. Hi, this is Dr. Jed Macosco at academicinfluence.com and Wake Forest University. And today we have a very special guest, Professor Adam Hart, uh, coming to us from the UK. So Professor Hart, it's, uh, it's good to see you. Now, can you tell us a little bit about your role as a uh, public spokesperson for science uh, at, the, at the university? Tell us a little bit about that. Uh, yeah, so I'm Professor of Science Communication at the University of Gloucestershire, and that's it's kind of an interesting role because actually most of the, a lot of my job is to do with teaching undergraduates and postgraduates and involved with research. But but quite a chunk of it is also involved in in uh, acting as a bridge, I suppose. Science communication is almost a bridge between uh, publishing scientists, you know, who are reading each other's work, but not necessarily getting it out there so much. And the, the public, which can include all sorts of people, including scientists a lot of the time, uh, politicians and so on. We, we sort of need that bridge between between the producers of science, if you like, and the people that are consuming it or needing it. And science communication forms that bridge. And, and I do quite a lot of work involved in, well, all kinds of areas from broadcasting, writing, uh, but also linking that into research. So some of the research I do uh, uses what's called citizen science. So we, we make use of the public and, and their enthusiasm for science to help us gather data on certain projects. And that gives us a really nice sort of avenue for, for getting the public in this, in my case, enthused about things like insects and, and particularly spiders. And, and actually, generally, I seem to work on things that people don't like very much. And, and that gives me a, a nice sort of way of trying to trying to sort of get their message across a little bit too and enthuse people about the science. Mm hmm. Um, well, I want to know a little bit more about this role you play and other people like you at other universities. Uh, but tell me, uh, spiders. Now, how did you get into spiders? I, I thought you, under you, you were studying social insects, uh, and I don't see spiders as one of those. So tell us a little more about that. Well, there are actually some um, fairly social spiders. They're a sort of nightmare for people that don't like spiders because you get hundreds of them living together in these big communal webs. You can find them down in, in South America. But but actually, my spider interest started because of citizen science. So um, I was really interested in these nuptial flights that you find. So we call them flying ants here. I'm not sure if that's the term across the world. But at certain times of the year, ants will start erupting out of the pavement, um, the winged ants, the reproductives, and they go up in the, the sky and lots of birds get a very nice um, lunch out of it. And that's what starts up new colonies and and we don't really know that much about them actually we don't know very much about the timing of them why they all seem to erupt at once what the cues are and the triggers and so on so i started quite a large scale citizen science project here in in 2012 looking at those emergencies and getting people to, to send us data back and that was a really successful project in terms of getting people engaged and the partners i was working with the royal society of biology sort of said yeah, this is really cool. Uh, let's do something like this again next year. We'll keep this running, but can we do something that that happens in the autumn that can um, coincide with National Biology Week so we can kind of link all these things together? And, you know, it's kind of a big ask. You know, we need a natural phenomenon that's going to happen during one week. It's not really the way the world works. But actually, it turns out in, in the UK, there's this thing that, that's become quite a big thing on social media, which is spider season. And what, what we find here is that around about end of the sort of September time, October, autumn, basically, uh, you get lots of people getting very excited or very terrified about these large uh, house spiders, as we call them, crawling around. And, and they're generally males looking for mates. And reading around, it turns out we don't know very much about their emergencies across the country, whether it sort of tracks across how it relates to the season and everything. So we started doing a citizen science project based on that, which which sort of exploded that year a little bit. I think it was a, a slow news cycle when our press release hit. So we ended up actually on the front page of one of the UK newspapers um, and all I, my, my phone went crazy for about a week. And we got sort of 10, 20,000 people ended up sending us in data, but, but an order of magnitude more than that engaged with us through the app and everything. And and most of that was about sort of saying to people, look, maybe you don't like spiders so much. I kind of get that a bit, but they've got this tremendous ecological value. They're actually incredible predators. They're brilliant for pest control. They do all these cool things. And it provided a nice, it was great for us to get some scientific data, but it provided this nice sort of launch pad for us to sort of get a toehold in and say to people that maybe, you know, maybe we can change your mind a little bit about, about spiders and I guess the hope is if you can convert someone that hates spiders into thinking, well, OK, maybe there's something that deserves respect, we might have a bit of hope 
converting people into sort of bigger environmental concerns, which are obviously, uh, you know, a bigger environmental concern right now. Yeah. Getting over that first fear of spiders and seeing them as part of this great creation we live in is the first step to taking care of the environment, cleaning things up. Yeah, that's brilliant. Um, so back to this issue of the uh, communicators of science. Uh, are there other universities that have a professor with that same kind of title? I've, I feel like I've heard uh, Richard Dawkins having a title similar to that, and he's another influencer on our list. Yeah, um, there's, there's quite a few, actually. Uh, you'll see people being called uh, professors of public engagement, for example, um, professors of science communication. Uh, we also have the term outreach, which is used quite a lot, although that tends to be used more for sort of uh, schools based activities, actually. But all of these things overlap. And, and yeah, we're seeing increasingly that um, that sort of position within science departments, because partly I think everyone's seen the value of, of doing this sort of work and of, and of acting as a bridge between science that a particular university is producing or a particular group is producing and, and the rest of the world, if you like. Um, but also, of course, within research, there's an increasing pressure, I think, on scientists to produce work with impact. You know, we're being told we've got to do impactful research. And, and part of that is having some sort of outreach, some sort of spread and reach and, and sort of uh, influence in terms of what we do. And I think that's where science communication can help. It can help to get your work out there. It can help to, to have people aware of it. So we are increasingly seeing people taking this more seriously. There's a number of master's courses now, postgraduate courses in, in the United Kingdom that look specifically at science communication. And we're seeing lots more roles actually for not just scientist communicators, which I suppose is, is what I am because I, I do the science and I communicate it, uh, but also for just f freelance science communicators, people going around festivals, schools, huge um, appetite actually for people that can come in and do cool science, right? The, the sort of stuff that makes school kids go, well, actually, you know what? Science is pretty, pretty cool. Well, schools can get science communicators in. So we're seeing now more and more courses that are looking to train people with the sorts of skills that, that can be applied to that. That's fascinating. So how did you personally get involved in this sort of profession, this subset of other professors that are doing research? Well, it's a, um, a sort of serendipitous story, really. I was working in, um, in a lab in Sheffield, and there was a French guy there who had done this fabulous research on the world's largest ant, uh, Dinopondera quadriceps, massive, great big thing, beautiful looking ant. And they, they live in fairly small colonies, about 30 or 40 of them sometimes. And they have a most amazing social structure. They like it's like watching a game it's like watching game of thrones basically watching these ants they're falling out with each other constantly there's a little group of them a little hierarchy that are always challenging the reproductive breeder and trying to tank over and she's always punishing them and there's just this bizarre sort of thing going on and he'd done a really good bit of work uh, looking at looking at a particular aspect of their biology that that the press loved um it was because the the queen if you like the reproductive in here was able to to mark if, if one of the other ants overstepped the mark a little bit and sort of tried to tank over, she would mark them with this very special pheromone that's only used for this job. And that would cause the other ants to basically kill this sort of uh, pretender to the throne. So it was sort of marked for death. There's a little mafia sort of links. It was all about a family group and stuff. So it was perfect for the press. Uh, but he didn't feel very confident talking in English on radio. Um, so he did, he did quite a few interviews, but he didn't want to do anything live. So he asked me if I would do it. And I said, yeah, that's fine. I was working on this ants too. And I, you know, I was aware of the work. And I went on to a local radio station here to talk about this research. First time I've done it, I can remember I was, I can remember doing it. I was very, very nervous, sat in my office, um, but started chatting to the DJ. He was really, really good. And we, I ended up being on that show for about an hour and a half in between all the sort of news and records because he kept asking me about insects. And then he would ask me about something else. And then he'd talk about mosquitoes or something. And we got to the end of it and he just said, will you come in every month and do a bug slot? And I said, yeah, that'd be brilliant. You know, live radio, you'll say yes to anything, right? Um, and I sort of hung up and I thought, that is cool. I really enjoyed that. And, and that was the beginning of, of wanting to communicate more, I think, or realizing that it was something I enjoyed. And, and then sort of around that time, I started working with a lot of schools as well uh, locally. And, and that was just a really enjoyable experience too. And, and that sort of just started building into a portfolio of, of communication activities, which which I, I maintained and then become, you know, that's, and so it grew basically. And so it grew, but, but at some point they must have given you the title uh, of science communicator at your university. How did that all happen? 
Yeah, so I applied for um, for a professorship. I applied for promotion, which is based on your you know, peer esteem factors and your publication record and all, all of that. But once you've you've sort of crossed that hurdle and they say yes, you know, you can have a personal chair, you get to call yourself what you want, really. Um, <laughs> and so I, I, I I thought I would 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 become professor of science communication because I felt that it would give it would give that side of what I do um, it would foreground it a little bit and it would make make it important that that's what we do because. Because actually, when it comes to a lot of things, it's the research that you produce. It's it's the other things, if you like, that you're judged on. But I think that that side of science, that communication, that outreach work is very, very important. Uh, and I kind of felt at the time that, that having that as part of my title was sort of a nice way of getting that into the foreground um, and, and linking through into, into other areas. So I teach on a master's course, for example, that is a very scientific course. It's applied ecology. Um, but I teach something that's to do with citizen science and public engagement and, and so on. And it's a nice way of getting that sort of thread, the importance of communication into, into lots of, of areas of, of, of science, of university life and of, of general sort of the way that we think about these things. Fascinating. Now, um, when you were choosing the name for your chair that you had earned through your good scholarship, um, did you look to other names of other Individuals, like I had mentioned Richard Dawkins, he seemed to have a similar title at one point, I think. Uh, um, how did that all work out? Yeah, so um, Dawkins had an endowed chair at Oxford, which is uh, a sort of public engagement and pu public understanding um, position. I forget the who public that understanding now. of science. That's yeah. right. That's right. Um, it, it's a strange thing, actually. About, about that time, there was a sort of big kind of conversation going on within science communication. Is it science communication? Is it public understanding, which was seen as a very sort of top down, quite sort of um, old school approach? Uh, is it to do with outreach, which then started to be seen as a bit fluffy? And, and there were all these sort of camps, you know, the usual sort of thing where people are you know, fighting over everything and you sort of stand back and go, hang on a minute, we're all doing the same thing. Um, so, yeah, I did, I did sort of go through a few uh, a few sort of thought um, movements. But, but I think science communication is broad enough because it encapsulates the whole thing it doesn't you know i could do sort of entomological communication but actually i end up talking about all kinds of things i was talking about black holes this morning um <laughs> so, so so science communication i think is a broad enough a broad enough base that it, it basically it gives me the freedom really uh to talk about anything that particularly interests me so i think that's um yeah and, uh, probably that was a well, major motivation the, yeah one of, one of the other influencers on our top list is eo wilson at Harvard, and I'm sure that you have studied him. Was he Indeed. somebody that you you looked to as you started dipping into um, social insects and sleeping in, or having having a lie in, as you say, yeah. uh, every morning, and not not going out and looking at the birds, but studying the social insects instead? Yes, um, yeah, Wilson's fantastic. Um, I've never met him. I have spoken to him on the phone once, actually, which was a real uh, a real thrill. But but yeah, he um, he's just this incredible incredible sort of giant of a, of a man in, in, in several respects within this field, but, but of course also within other fields because you realize he's, you know, he's thinking about all kinds of things, island biogeography, ecology. You know, he's looking at how all this stuff links up. But yeah, in terms of social insects, the Insect Society is his book in, back in the 70s. Yeah, I've got my well-thumbed copy of that. I've got Hold Dobler and Wilson, the ants. I mean, these are absolutely, I mean, that's a Pulitzer Prize winning book. These are influential works. And, and and in fact, when I started doing my uh, my main PhD sort of work, which was looking at this idea of task partitioning, sort of passing material through chains of different individuals, I was using leaf cutting ants, and it was a real kind of thrill to me actually that the 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 papers on which most of what I was doing was sort of building actually sort of go back through the kind of line to a couple of really influential papers from Wilson in the 1980s, where he. He basically decided, it's almost like he decided he was going to get on top of leaf cutting ants, an organization. And he's just got these beautiful couple of papers where everything's outlined. And there's just, I still go back to them now for these sort of really useful kind of things. And, and yeah, that was, that was really, really good. And, and obviously he's gone on to, to write lots of different books on all kinds of areas, bringing together the way we think about the planets, you know, well, well beyond just ants. But, but there's always room for ants in those works. But but really looking at things in the round and looking at much bigger bigger issues. And I think yeah, he's um he's yeah really a really influential scientist. Mm. Well, we we interviewed uh, Niles Eldritch earlier uh, about punct punctuated equilibrium, um, and he was re recalling his uh, first 
visit at uh, Columbia University in, in New York. And above the door of the paleontology and geology building was, you know, ask the rocks and they will tell you, which is, I guess uh, he told me it was a verse out of the Bible from the book of Job. And of course, there is a verse in Proverbs, I think, about uh, go to the ant and learn wisdom. So uh, have you, and, you know, Wilson and, and your colleagues in these social insects, have you learned something that you can say is, is wisdom that we as humans can learn from? Yeah, go, go thee to the ant, thou sluggard, consider her ways and be wise. Um, yeah, Solomon, <laughs> early, early form of social biomimetics, right? he realized that, that they had something to teach us. He also says, go thee to the ants, uh, consider her way. So he also realized that those ants were female, which I think is you know, he's a clever guy, apparently, old Solomon. He's known for it, isn't he? But, but yeah, the ants can provide us with all kinds of, of interesting parallels, but also some lessons. Uh, lots of businesses use ant-inspired algorithms to organize themselves because and self-organize and they do it by following very simple rules and they're able to solve really quite complex problems and uh, i met i, I, met, I did a, a film for the bbc uh, about eight years ago now i guess um when i went to visit a company in houston that uses an ant-inspired algorithm to work out its delivery structure and it saved such a lot of money uh it's, it's fundamental to their business absolutely incredible how they, they they're using these sorts of sort of inspired algorithms to to solve those problems but I think we don't just need to look at kind of computing sciences. Um, I, I think a really there's a really amazing thing when you put someone in front of an ant colony or an observation beehive. Say you've got honeybees in sort of those glass sort of fronted tanks, um, and you, you 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 just leave them for 10, 15 minutes, and then you come back. Two things will happen. The first is that they are generally speaking absolutely transfixed, and they have about a thousand questions because you can't help but look at them and and, and take it in. But the second thing is they'll go. It's funny, really. A lot of them aren't doing anything. And because we have this idea as busy as a bee, but actually they're not busy all the time. And what we now know, and this is where I think we can learn something, right? Not doing something can sometimes be as important as doing something. And, and what, what evolution has sort of enforced upon the bees is that, listen, if you've got nothing to do, don't do anything, right? You're wasting energy. The colony has to replace that energy somehow. That's an extra foraging trip for someone where they might get killed, right? Don't run around wasting energy. If you've not got a job to do, sit still. Also, if you're sitting still somewhere, you're not running around getting in anyone else's way. You're not spreading diseases and parasites. Um, and so when ants and bees don't have anything to do, you know, they don't do anything. And, and, and that struck me as, as quite a, an important lesson. You know, let's, Very often we run around doing things needlessly. And actually, sometimes we need to stop and think and think maybe what we should do is sit quietly and have a think. Um, so, yeah, that's, that's, that's my personal lesson from, from the ants. Sometimes it's Sometimes it's adaptive to do nothing. Um, but yeah, certainly from the business perspective and a more useful financial perspective, you can, um, we, we can certainly draw a lot of inspiration from them. And I'm sure we'll continue to do that, actually, because the more we look at these species, the, the greater we appreciate their biology and then the more questions we can answer and the more questions, of course, we then end up asking. So, yeah, we'll continue to learn from them for many years to come, I'm sure. Well, thank you so much. That is a great place to end our interview. Uh, to turn this off and to go sit in our easy chair with our cat that sleeps 18 hours a day and doesn't do much <laughs> and, and have a think, as you said, think about the world, think about how we can make this place a better place, whether it's not killing a spider, uh, letting it live and do its job or um, taking care of uh, climate change and uh, the pollution that, that the, the humans have, have put into the world. So thank you for all these wonderful thoughts that you've given us today, Professor Hart. Thank you.